So I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Martin Kafina. Dr. Kafina grew up in Brooklyn in Park Slope. He completed his BA in chemistry at Lake Forest College in Illinois and then did graduate work at the University of Wisconsin. He then returned to Brooklyn to attend SUNY Downstate and graduated from medical school in 1982. He stayed at Kings County University Hospital of Brooklyn for internship and then did residency in internal medicine at St. Vincent's, followed by fellowship in rheumatology and immunology at Yale. After moving to Bos the Boston area approximately 25 years ago, Dr. Kafina has been affiliated with Beth Israel Deaconess, New England Baptist Hospital, and Harvard Medical School. He is an active teacher of rheumatology and of doctoring to Harvard medical students. He is currently on staff at Emerson Hospital in Concord, Massachusetts, and has private rheumatology practices in Boston and Concord, where I would bet he diagnoses and treats Lyme disease on a daily basis. Um, his talk this morning is entitled Immunity in Lyme Arthritis. Welcome, Dr. Kafina. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, Downstate has some giants in immunology and microbiology and rheumatology. You know, I think of Stanley Plotkin, who has invented many vaccines. And then there's Charlie Plotz who discovered the rheumatoid factor. And not only was he a rheumatologist, but he also was chairman of family medicine. Dr. Morali, who's now the chief of immunology at Mass General. David Kaplan, who was my fourth year dean. And of course, Dr. Josephson. Yeah, okay. So um, Lyme disease, well, I'm almost not sure where to start. It's become a, a complete epidemic. I, I live 10 miles outside of Boston in Concord. And um, they had said there's 30,000 new cases a year, but the CDC just changed that, that there are 300,000 new cases a year. It's just the number one vector-borne infectious disease in, in the world. And it's all over the world, Russia, China, Greece, California, all over. And they actually discovered Borrelia burgdorferi DNA in that 5,000-year-old Iceman that they dug out of the Eastern Alps. Uh, Otzi is his name. So he had Lyme disease as well. So as you probably know, the condition was originally described more recently by the Yale group, Alan Steer and, and his co-workers. What happened was um, an artist in, in Lyme, Connecticut, um, Polly Murray, said she hadn't been feeling well for years and something wasn't right, and she saw that several kids in Lyme all developed juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which was a very rare type of arthropathy. So she went to the um, Yale Rheumatology and Epidemiology group, and they researched it. So they felt that it was not JRA, but it was an infection. This here is the erythema chronica migrans rash, uh, called the bullseye rash. Oftentimes, you will miss this in about 50 to 60 percent of cases. And although we often hear it to be a polyarthritis or an oligoarthritis, one of the most common presentations is when some kid gets referred to our office from orthopedics with a large swollen knee. And in fact, this is what's known as late stage Lyme. So these little kids playing soccer have had the Lyme for years and they develop a huge effusion in their knee. And, you know, they, the feeling is that maybe they tore their meniscus or something like that, but it's Lyme disease. And if you biopsy it, it looks exactly like rheumatoid arthritis. So somebody like that has what's known as tertiary Lyme arthritis. Uh, no, no trauma, 
orthopedic evaluation with synovial thickening present. And the white count is often between 20 and 60,000, and it tests positive for, for Lyme. So send these patients to rheumatology. Lyme disease is incredibly fascinating because we know the etiology of the microbe that's causing the inflammation. If you recall from medical school, you learned about reactive arthritis and Reiter's syndrome, where we had noted that the German general in the First World War had seen that his troops in the trenches and coming back from Saturday night had all kinds of GU and GI microbes and they developed lower extremity arthropathy. So that's Reiter's syndrome. The, the, the name was changed to reactive arthritis to be politically correct. But so Lyme is somewhat like that because we know the etiology. The tricky thing about the Lyme is that the spirochete is what's known as a stealth pathogen. So it's the, similar to the microbe that caused syphilis. And if you recall, syphilis was a stage one, stage two, and stage three. And Lyme is, is something like that. And it doesn't really release any virulent, virulence factors or toxins, but it takes the immune system's host to cause the inflammation. So the effect of the immune system on the organism and the effects of the immune response on the host is what actually will, will um, cause the inflammation. I think Winston Churchill had said that the Soviet Union is an enigma wrapped in a puzzle inside a mystery. The same holds true for the spirochete. It's a, it's a very tricky microbe. After the, the Yale group discovered uh, Lyme, it took a long time before they actually delineated what the microbe was. They thought it was a virus or some form of staph. So they, they, they got a bunch of ticks, about 200 from Shelter Island, and they put it on about 20 rabbits from the University of Wisconsin and they analyzed it at the Rocky Mountain Spotted Labs, and they determined that it was, in fact, a spirochete. It had the proper immunofluorescence, and they did DNA, DNA hybridization studies, and it turned out to be a spirochete. But this took over five years before they were able to isolate that this was a spirochete. So the stages and the organs affected are here. There's the skin. It goes through the skin. That's called early localized disease. Then it becomes early disseminated. And then it, you have later disease, where it goes into the brain, joint tissue, and skin. Um, this is just a cartoon showing um, the, di the different stages and where the um, spirochete is released from the uh, tick gut. This is a this is a closer picture. You see here that the spirochete gets released through the dermis, and then it latches on to different host factors in in the human. So it will latch on to plasminogen, and it will use this serine protease to help it burrow through extracellular tissue. So when it leaves the bloodstream, it can actually tether through these endothelial cells, and then it will go outside of the bloodstream. And once it's outside of the bloodstream, it's much more difficult for the, for the host to um, detect it. So I'm talking a bit about the tick. <clears throat> this is the Exodes damini tick that is the vector. So as you know, this, this, um, this tick gets laid through eggs where, when it becomes a larvae, and then it has a blood meal where it molts into a nymph, and those are very, very small, and that's the most dangerous stage because you can't see the nymph. And then later it, 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 it gets a little larger and it um, goes onto a, a deer, where it can mate. 
Um, there's been all kinds of wonderful research on these different um, vectors and hosts and how we can um, determine if perhaps we could treat it from an ecological point of view. Here you see these, there's these little halers organs which allows the tick to crawl up a blade of grass waiting to see something that's moist and a mammal and then it will latch on and get a blood meal where you have this hypostome with cement and it will then suck some blood uh, and this is when the spirochete changes. So the spirochete has an outer surface protein A, which I'll talk about in its, in its mid-gut. But then once it starts to move towards the salivary glands, it ch changes to an outer surface protein C. And that's when it will be released into the human dermis. It's interesting to note that the, the, the saliva, the, this is called a spit pit, the saliva actually will protect the spirochete from the human host. So it, it, it covers the spirochete from certain uh, inflammatory mediators. This is another diagram showing how the, the different stages of the tick. So it molts and then it, it, it becomes a nymph and during these times, the, the spirochete will traverse through the gut and wind up in the salivary glands. It's important to know that the Lyme disease also has other infections that are very serious. It has anaplasmosis and ehrlichia. In many ways, these are even more serious than Lyme because they can kill you quickly. They, uh, they give you a, a, a severe hepatitis, a severe thrombocytopenia, high fevers. And more recently, they've isolated the Powassum flavivirus, which the tick can release within 15 minutes, and it can cause a severe encephalitis. Whereas for Lyme, the tick has to be on you for two whole days for it to regurgitate the spirochete into your skin, into the dermis. Um, this is a, a nice picture showing the spit pit, and what can happen is the spirochete is protected by this SALP15, and you can see the outer surface protein C here. Um, also becomes expressed. At the same time, you have the spirochetes being taken up from the, by the dendritic cells, which go to the lymph nodes, and there's a very rigorous immune response. So the immune system is very good to kill the spirochete. The, the problem is, is that the spirochete can hide, and then when it goes extracellular, then sometimes it could hide in certain niches. There's a, a dramatic um, B cell response um, in this infection, and there's a lot of antibody uh, production. Interestingly, you, you may have remembered that we did have a good vaccine for the um, Lyme disease. This was um, developed both at Yale as well as in Germany, at the Max Planck Institute. And it was a very nice vaccine in that it, it used the out of surface protein A to develop an antibody response. The problem with it is that there were a multitude of advocacy groups that were claiming that the out of surface protein A was actually causing the Lyme disease. So there was uh, many lawsuits and Beach Klein pulled it from the market when it went from $40 million a year to $4 million a year. But they're still looking to come back with that vaccine because it was very efficacious. Three doses and 80% people would no longer get Lyme disease. This is what the spirochete looks like closer up. It has this um, flagella, which is a, a periplasmic uh, motility flagella, and it 
it, it's different than other types of flagella in that it's, it's periplasmic and it actually allows the spirochete to move in a corkscrew fashion. And by moving in a corkscrew fashion, it can burrow through the tissues. This is a closer up picture. You see you have the, um, this protein here is on, is, is on the um, outer membrane. This is what protects the spirochete from complement. Here's your outer surface protein C and A. There's the flagella. And then also there's different proteins that have antigenic variation like here. So this is one of the major outer proteins where there's continual antigenic shift. And that allows the spirochete to hide from the human host. They're also trying to make a new vaccine with this VLSE surface protein. And there's also a good blood test that is available by Igenex for this um, protein. There has been some controversy with the um, blood test, which I'll talk about in a moment. But it's nice that the Borrelia genome has been completely described, 910 base pairs. It has um, a multitude of circular and linear plasmids. There is a bunch of redundancy. We understand the um, biochemistry of it. It is basically using glycolysis and the emden meyerhaf pathway. It does not use the TCA cycle or electron transport for energy. It has glyceraldehyde phosphate that, that helps with its energy. Here's an interesting case. An 80-year-old female comes in with tingling all over her face and body. Nobody knows what's wrong with her. She's just tingling. The neurologist sends her to rheumatology. This is typical Lyme disease. Her blood test was quite positive. Before we knew what caused it, Yale group would follow these patients over time. And you could see here that if you follow these patients over five years, erythema chronica migraines alone was noted in pa some patients. ECM with arthralgia alone was noted. In these patients, they had episodic arthritis. But again, the most dramatic presentation is when the patient comes in with a red swollen knee that's aching and that it looks like monoarticular rheumatoid arthritis. So that's Lyme. Also, interestingly, over time, one's own immune system seems to decrease the number of attacks. So this is over a number of years, and with time, you seem to slowly get better, unless it goes to the nervous system. Also of interest is during episodes of severe arthritis, the outer surface protein A seems to be expressed. Very interestingly, the outer surface protein A is the one that's expressed when the spirochete is in the tick's mid-gut. But then when it goes into the human, you see outer surface protein C. But then it kind of morphs during episodes of arthritis and you have this outer surface protein A. That's why we were so pleased when we did develop the vaccine because it does um, react from an immune point of view out of surface protein A. But generally the spirochetes have out of protein surface C. So what would happen is when the tick took a blood meal, the antibody against out of surface protein A would actually kill the spirochete in the tick's gut. So that was an interesting twist on things. The blood meal from the human that had the antibody to out of protein surface A would kill the spirochete in the tick's gut. We use Westin blotting, which, which is fairly good. It's, it's not perfect. Um, IgM and IgG. Then we have um, spirochete proteins. We also look at these on the Westin blot and try to make a diagnosis. 
there are significant false positives and false negatives. Early disseminated disease, you're going to see a carditis, a meningitis, lymphadenopathy. It could affect the eye, the liver, and the kidney. About 50 years ago, a, 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 a Swedish neurologist described it as Banmoth's syndrome, where you had a meningoradiculitis, and this was from um, Lyme disease, although it wasn't called that back then. So that's neuroborreliosis. Late stage Lyme, you could see an encephalopathy, an encephalomyelitis, neuroborreliosis, and acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans. This acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans we see more in Europe, which is caused by the spirochete Borrelia afzeli, whereas the spirochete Borrelia gorinii causes more neurologic disease. Here we had a construction worker complaining to his wife that he was exhausted. He had a low-grade alcoholic hepatitis. Brain MRI was normal. He had Lyme disease. Here we have a hunter. I get a lot of hunters. They like hunting in, in, in Massachusetts. Pro profound fatigue. He has Lyme disease. Then we had a 65-year-old female came into the rheumatology office with a severe diffuse erythematous rash extending over the trunks, low-grade fever. Western blot was markedly positive. Again, diffuse erythema chronica migraines, large circular rashes, and it's rather dramatic. The big thing is to discern what is Lyme and what is not. So we hear a lot about this thing called chronic Lyme versus post-Lyme syndrome. Most rheumatologists and immunologists like to call it post-Lyme syndrome. These patients get objective findings like swollen joints. They kind of get a lupus-like syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, but there's some patients that don't have any of this, and they just come in with fatigue. I don't feel well, doc. I have Lyme disease. I want you to give me long-term antibiotics. So that's what the controversy is. There's been a huge problem. The, the uh, Connecticut government sued the Infectious Disease Society because they said that the, um, the docs were not giving enough antibiotics to the um, Lyme patients. Some of these patients want antibiotics for five years. It's, it's just unbelievable. So we like the diagnosis to be made on an objective, suggestive clinical findings. We don't want absolutely nothing and it being called Lyme. Here's a seronegative Lyme patient. Um, she was taking antibiotics regularly. She had a big rash, but see, if you take the antibiotics when the patient is bitten, then it's going to be a false negative. Sometimes it could look like the gout, monoarthritis. Mono this patient had a big swollen ankle. She had just come back from Martha's Vineyard and had some shrimp and lobster. I thought she had the gout. I was wrong. That was Lyme. Here's a patient who had ocular diplopia and nothing else. That was Lyme. So if you look at the joint more closely, you're going to see a lot of white cells and plasma cells and T cells. Um, there's a, an exuberant inflammatory response with immune complexes. So the immune system is trying to deal with the infection. But again, the spirochete down-regulates its out-of-surface proteins. So the problem is, is that the immune system doesn't have anything to attack. Here we see that these toll-like receptors, right, right, right over here, the toll-like receptors are very important to turn on the immune response. And with inflammation, we can have uh, metalloproteinases um, secreted, um, IL-12, um, uh, as well as some of the less inflammatory interleukins like IL-10. 
So we have a whole bunch of patients that even though we soak them in antibiotics, they don't seem to get better. And this is called antibiotic refractory versus antibiotic responsive arthritis. So the different theories of this is that either it's a persistent infection, that there's still spirochetes in the patient, there's retained spirochetal antigens, there's infection-induced autoimmunity, or there's bystander activation. So this is important. So how, how, how do you determine if there's persistent infection? Because the patients are saying that they want more antibiotics. So the new way that we're doing this is with a xenodiagnosis. So we put laboratory-bred ticks on patients that are sterile, and we let them get a blood meal for several days, and then we'll take off the ticks and examine them to see if there's any spirochetes in the ticks. How many of you think that this is a good idea? Yeah, I mean, this is a way to finalize the question of whether the patient has chronic Lyme disease. Put a sterile tick on the patient, let it get a blood meal, and then dissect the tick to see if there are any spirochetes. So that's what we're doing. The spirochetes can survive in a niche in the joint or CNS that is protected from antibiotics. You could have retained spirochete antigens, which might perpetuate synovial inflammation after eradication of the live spirochete. Membrane-bound blebs may detach from the parent organism. And then um, there's a concern for autoimmunity in that there's a section of the antibodies that react with out-of-protein surface A that seems to cross-react with certain amino acids on human leukocyte antigen. And there seems to be a certain degree of autoimmunity which can perpetuate inflammation. Borrelia burgdorferi induced pro-inflammation might cause persistent synovial inflammation because of failure to regulate the innate or adaptive immune response. Treatment is with doxycycline, in the patients who are really sick, we'll give them intravenous rocephin. In those patients that don't do well, we put them on DMARDs. We put them on methotrexate, Plaquenil, steroids. Sometimes we'll use intravenous infliximab. And sometimes we'll actually shave the synovium. It's like you're taking away the synovium to get rid of any of the antigen. The other way to try to treat these patients is to cull the deer, is to you know, get rid of the deer but um, there's a lot of laws that don't allow that. We're also trying to vaccinate the mice with oral bait so that the mice don't get infected with the spirochetes. And so that is another way to try to fix the problem from an ecological point of view. And, and I think I'll end here and, and address any questions. There's not too much Lyme disease in Brooklyn, but I think there's a lot in Westchester and, and Long Island. You know, I, I get tons of patients refer to me, just arthralgias, I don't feel well, headache, blood tests. So the ELISA is, is sensitive but nonspecific, whereas the Western blot is specific but not sensitive. So I would say that maybe 60% of my patients have positive blood tests. But again, I have a huge number of patients that have been treated for Lyme the blood tests have slowly declined, and now they've gone on to develop another rheumatologic condition like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. So they morph from a Lyme disease patient to a true rheumatologic type of lupus patient. 
and we have to treat them accordingly. But a lot of those patients don't want that diagnosis. They don't want to be told that they have lupus. They don't want to be told that they have, you know, multiple sclerosis or other types of autoimmune conditions. They want to be told they have Lyme so you could treat it with antibiotics. But it's very serious because um, last weekend I, I went to the library in preparation for this talk and there was in Concord Library, which is a beautiful little library, they had literally 30 books on patients telling their story of how Lyme disease has destroyed their lives, almost killed them, and then there's a huge Lyme consortium of parents from all over the world claiming that their second graders have Lyme and they're not doing well in school. So it's really a problem. You know, uh, who do these patients go to? They go to the internet Google and they hear, oh my gosh. So that's, that's the deal. Yes. No, you, you don't. That's, that's part of the problem. Um, so maybe I should change my title. But I mean, the, 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 the immune system protects the human from spirochetes to a certain degree. So you see a large spectrum, people who get Lyme who are rather asymptomatic, or patients who get erythema chronica migrans that just get the rash and they don't get any other symptoms. On the other hand, you have patients who are incredibly ill. I just had a 19-year-old that had Lyme two years ago. She was treated thoroughly, and now two years later, she's getting headaches and arthralgias. And her Lyme tests are equivocal. So what we're gonna do with her is we're gonna give her a lumbar puncture to see if there's a pleocytosis or if the PCR could pick up any Borrelia um, DNA. But in patients like that, you know, we give them intravenous rocephin for four to six weeks. So, yeah. Is there any uh, relationship between, you know, Connecticut and Wisconsin have a tremendously high incidence of uh, Lyme disease, but we also have a big problem with chronic wasting disease in deer. And so it's always been a question on my mind, is a chronic, you know, chronic wasting disease in deer really related more to Lyme disease in deer? That's a good question. The, the, the deer are hosts so that the adult tick can mate on the deer. But once they mate on the deer, they fall off and they lay their eggs and die. So the point is, is that the deer is not felt to be a vector for the spirochete. In other words, it could be an autoimmune disease too, in a deer. You mean, for, for, you mean from the uh, tick bite? Right. That's certainly possible. You need to get an anti-nuclear antibody.